Mapping the Mind, um, been doing these conferences now for five years, and they're bringing together all these puzzle pieces of the indigenous healing, the healthcare aspect, the neuroscience aspect, and the historical aspects all together to try and make this puzzle fit. Um, and I'll scooch to the side here. So um, our first question here, and you can ask either panelists or all of them. My name is Michelle Gervais. Michelle Gervais. Hello, Matt. Hello, Hi, Michelle. I'm a retired uh, provincial officer, and I don't give a shit, Matt. Nice. Take your place. <laughs> Dr. Rush, my question is for you. I'm a grandmother with an autistic man. And everything I've read about IUS has said that it's even more autistic and more effective for healing the brain of an autistic person. How do you I'm looking for guidance on how this stuff should be used. I'm I'm actually going in blind with an autistic person who trusts me. And I'm desperate to find some research somewhere that says, well, you should use this kind of dosage, or you should have five ceremonies, or you should maybe not ever let this kid touch it, ever. Yeah. And I could find nothing. Do you know anybody that I could contact? Around autism, no. There, let me go on. There's, first, I can hear in your, in your voice the, the need, so I respect that. The, and, and as you know, autism exists on a really wide spectrum, so you'd have to be very careful um, where on that spectrum and the person's ability and what kind of support they might need. And uh, so there's really not much that I've seen on autism, certainly nothing um, super suggestive. I don't know what you've been reading. With so much e uh, illegality around research, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. But there, so there's nothing concrete about dosage or so on. My own advice would be no. Uh, you might want to start with something softer. Um, it's a pretty powerful experience, and I, I'd be concerned about the person's capacity to manage that. But again, uh, autism is on a huge spectrum, so, but I would just be a bit cautious. My grandson is actually very high functioning. He works. The only thing I'm really trying to heal is he wants to make social connections, and he's not yeah. able to. Of course, that's autism. So yeah, that's interesting. It, I mean, it may work because that's kind of what the medicine does. It allows for connectivity. There's also something powerful about being in the group. You notice most ayahuasca is done in a group, and MDMA and other medicines tend to be one-on-one -on -one with therapy. I think there's a reason for that. The group experience is part of the healing. But I'd just be very cautious, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Um, we see a lot more research coming out of Israel right now with different things like CBD oil. But when it comes to psychedelics, we're not quite there yet when it comes to those types of disorders. Um, but absolutely, that is an area of research we'd love to see it go into. I did a bad thing. <laughs> Instead of giving my grandson big pharma drugs for anxiety and depression, I gave him marijuana. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is absolutely the thing. We're trying to break some of that stigma, especially with CBD oil, where it's non-psychoactive. Who else would like to ask a wonderful question? Our friend here. I, I can relate to that uh, feeling of guilt that uh, they're breaking the law um, myself because uh, I have a, a sister who's a first responder herself that's about to retire. And I can't imagine how she deals with the things that she's encountered in 25 to 30 years in the police force. But uh, first of all, I, I want to um, thank you uh, and those involved for making this movie because uh, I think it was exceptionally well done. And it presented the facts in a way that allowed us to use our own brains to interpret them, which is uh, really good. So um, today is a day that uh, I'm always upset. My depression kicks in on the 11th of September for the last 18 years. And last year on this date, I, I knocked on the door of a church that I'd never been in before, and the minister talked to me for a couple hours. This year, I was looking for something, some observance in Toronto for this, this date. 
that uh, means so much to our lives, has changed our lives so much. And what I'm getting at is here, um, there are things worth hating in this world. Some of us are burdened with the responsibility of fighting these fights. So although I would like to block the pain um, that's caused by my awareness of the corruption in our society today, the genocide that's happening in Palestine, the pollution that's, that's giving every other person cancer, simply taking a drug that makes me not think about it is not an alternative for me. I do self-medicate and I have my whole life, using marijuana my whole life. Fortunately, I never became an alcoholic like all my friends that I've buried in the last few years have. But um, I spent a year of complete sobriety after um, too much uh, of the 1980s in the film business, as you can imagine. And um, now I have the ability of moderation. And it seems that this ayahuasca allows people some the ability to, to moderate themselves a little bit, too. I, I don't know. But what I'm, the question, I guess, that I should get to is, isn't the underlying root to these problems the crisis that makes us upset? Isn't the underlying root to these problems the fact that, you know, maybe Trump and Putin should be taking ayahuasca or the Clintons or something instead of us? Aren't they the ones with the problem and not us? I recommend for our friend Doug. <laughs> yeah. I think policymakers could learn a lot from experiences. So just to wrap up, uh, I think uh, I don't see ayahuasca as providing enlightenment. I see it as blocking the inhibitors that prevent us from enjoying life, that blocks the pain, the hate, the guilt, and those factors. And therefore, it allows people that are, are traumatized to have a normal life. And I appreciate that. And um, especially to, uh, to Matt here and Debbie, whose uh, duties place them into situations that we can't even imagine. Um, but then there's the people that have a choice and join the army to fight. And on this day, 18 years ago, the longest, bloodiest, and most expensive war in the history of the world was begun. And let's not forget that. Because if we get rid of that war, we're not going to be depressed. And we won't need high risk. Thank you. Can I comment on one thing? Please, Brian. Uh, one thing that Debbie said really resonated with me. And that is, and it's related to this comment that yes, it opens you up to beauty and um, the, the feelings of love, et cetera, et cetera, but it also makes you more sensitive to the, to the darkness, more sensitive to things that are not going well, uh, to the point of, of breaking your heart in ceremony sometimes, but, but after ceremony, you're still left with that, aren't you? Uh, the sadness of what you're describing. And... Um, Another comment related came to me this morning on, on CBC Radio where they were discussing a documentary of, uh, of a film of uh, police officers and Matt's story resonated totally. And the uh, filmmaker just said, um, our, our first responders, et cetera, et cetera, are dealing with the boogeyman every day. Boogeyman, in terms of the, from an energetic point of view, the negative stuff, but seeing things that we don't want to see. It came up in the, in the conversation like there was things that, that happened in the police force and, and so on that, that are not talked about. And, and is that a good thing? Is there like something going on that should be more open? And the, and the guy said, there's some things at the Boogeyman uh, that you guys have seen deal with every day and we have to really think about that and respect that so it does it the med, back to your point it, it opens you up and can make you more empathetic and more more focused and more concerned about the damage that we're doing and sometimes that can sit pretty heavy on you including hearing a presentation like today it can sit there and say oh, Jesus, there's a lot of shit there. Right, so just, you know, 
we see a lot about the moral injury we hear about from all first responders and even physicians and people who just do patient care in general, where sometimes we are involved in situations that are not quite in control, whether even in an emergency room, there are times where overwhelming and staff isn't able to do everything they can, so they pull together and they do the best they could for that patient and sometimes still things don't go great. Um, I can even say a lot of my colleagues as paramedics um, during certain calls, just to get that person to that hospital and to keep them alive, they had to kind of detach from the human being on the stretcher. And that right there causes a big moral injury that that person becomes the thing you're trying to fix. And that's where I see psychedelics helping a lot with first responders is reconnecting us with the human being in front of us and that human being inside of ourselves. And of course the work that I love that Brian reminds us of is that, I think, fits into your puzzle piece there, my friend, is the work we must all do as a society and support ourselves. Is there anybody, oh, sorry. So I just wanted to, to comment also on that. I was really thinking about um, what you were saying, and, and I know before I was looking, I looked for problems, and my job was to find a problem and find a solution, and if I couldn't find a solution at that point, I was just like, okay, hey, whatever, move on to the next one. I didn't have that, that human contact. One thing that ayahuasca has done for me is it has made me appreciate more of what's going on that's good in the world. And I know that I can only control some certain things. The only thing I can really control is what goes on with me. So my philosophy going into it was the better I am, the better I am to everyone else around me. I now take a point where I can look at things and, and say, you know what? This is a beautiful planet. It's being destroyed. What can I do? Because I'm one person. So now what do I do? I do everything I can to take care of, of my family and to grow our own vegetables, to be um, a little more, um, I guess, with common sense when it comes to, to consumption, and also to just project that. Not to try and tell somebody how to live their life, but just to show them that it's making me happier and I'm more harmonious with the things around me. And my only thoughts are if I can do that with me and give off a little bit of energy and maybe somebody else feels that energy, well, that's one other person. And the more people that do that, be it using a psychedelic or not, be it meditation, yoga, exercise, everyone has to find a tool to make themselves just emanate that positive energy to start eliminating all that evil shit that's going on and the destruction that's going on in our world. It breaks my heart to see what's going on in the Amazon right now. All I need to do is just focus on keeping out my positive outlook and showing people that, you know what, we've got to really appreciate the simple things in life and hopefully I get through to one person. If I get through to one person, maybe they'll get through to one person. And I'm just wishing for that chain reaction that over generations, we're going to eliminate all the crap that we've witnessed through our lives and hope that our children are going to grow up going, man, our parents are really messed up. Look what they did to the world. Like, That's just my hope and that's what I got out of it, but again, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a psychedelic, but for me, that was a very powerful tool, the most powerful tool. So I don't know if that, that helps you with any of that. Okay. Debbie. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to see if Debbie, you have anything to say of any of these questions? Um, just really quickly, um, it's a different uh, perspective on it, and I think it kind of harnesses in on what Matt was saying as well, because essentially what I got from you is you're talking about energies and energy forces in the world, right? Right? Um, I had an experience in ceremony where, and like my retreat was, we spent a whole day of integration. So you're listening to the horrific stories of, you know, everybody for eight, nine hours a day. And I mean, I was in one of these uh, facilities that catered to highly resistant, traumatized people. So I mean, you're listening to stories from people who were in child uh, sex rings and like some serious stuff. So I was having difficulty with, you know, absorbing all this and just the emotion of it. And uh, the shaman said to me one day, he's like, you know, it's not so much about the story and you're feeling it. The difficulty is, is that negative energy that's coming out is attaching to something that's within you. So the more you can process your own stuff, the more you can clear yourself, the easier it is to let these things come in and go through you without them harnessing and really changing your vibration and changing um, it in, into a negative outlook. So that's what I found really useful with ayahuasca as well, for whatever that helps. Thank you.
<laughs> Are we okay to do one more question maybe? Um, yeah, we'll do one more question, then we can, we'll wrap things up and we'll be good there. Oh, thanks, you guys are awesome. The Grand Girard Theater, the most easygoing place I've been to in a while. <laughs> Thank you guys. And then our, a question here. Uh, not a question, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Um, my name is Jennifer Carney. Hi Matt, we spoke on the phone. Um, I saw Matt's um, video when it uh, played on the news, CBS or CBC. Um, and I was just having coffee that morning and I saw it and I, I called you that morning or I think I texted you and I'm like, I gotta talk to you. Um, my background is um, I had a son that uh, I lost from suicide in 2012 and um, my journey, um, I, I found ayahuasca at some point. Um, so for the, since uh, 2013, I have been involved in a number of ayahuasca ceremonies, uh, primarily Costa Rica, so I go to Costa Rica quite often, a few times a year. Um, I have a huge uh, family that I've basically um, become part of there. And uh, this year I'm starting to run my own retreats, um, primarily just to bring people to the medicine. And uh, I just wanted to, to say, and I did leave some flyers here and I can happy to talk more. And I, I'd love to talk more actually with all of you. I thank you for um, everything you've shared today. Uh, the dialogue regarding all of these plant medicines is just so important. Um, because I've experienced uh, some of it, I, I've used ayahuasca hachuma um, combo, which is the frog medicine, um, I, and, and cannabis a little bit, um, but really not the others. I just signed up for uh, placebo study for LSD this week, so we'll see how that goes. So the University of Toronto, <laughs> they're just starting that, so I'll see how that goes. Um, but um, it, it's so important, the dialogue is so important. Uh, the movie, um, wow, the, the movie was spectacular, um, very touching. The last scene of, you know, coming home, I, that just, that got me. Um, any of us that have experienced any type of, um, ceremony um, or plant medicine, um, you really get that because you're really going inside, deep inside. Um, and when you start to have breakthroughs, that's when you are really coming home uh, to yourself. And you know, Ram Dass said it best, we're all just walking each other home and that expression has always sat really, really well with me. I really love that. Um, at any rate, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm hoping I can connect with all of you again more. Um, the journey is so amazing. Um, sharing it and having the dialogue going out there is so important because everyone has questions. It's really hard to understand it until you've experienced it and there's so much um, pain and trauma um, that all of us are experiencing every day. And the healing continues. You, it's not a fix. You don't go and, and get fixed one time. I had a very good friend say to me, you're kind of better now. Like why, I'm just, I love you, but can you explain to me why you keep going back? And these are friends that, they, they smoke pot all the time, not to get high, but for medicinal reasons. So they get that part of it, but they've never experienced ayahuasca, so they don't really understand it. And I have to just keep kind of bravely um, explaining to them and keep the dialogue open so that they understand. And the more that they start to hear other people talking about it and they watch movies such as this, that's when they start to say, I really get it. Without even experiencing it themselves, they start to, that's the way the human brain works, that's how we are, we need evidence, um, and that's, you know, Part of my journey has also been, you know, yoga training, meditation, and we learn to turn the brain off. We learn to turn it off. We learn to have a little bit of brain control so that we can just feel um, our way and feel the energies that are around us, which you know if you've been in ceremony. Um, so yeah, we need to just keep talking. And movies like this so so important. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Do we have any? Um, oh. Yes, please. We have another question coming up here. Uh, but, um, I think just before, does anyone have anything to say on that specifically? I think you yourself did a beautiful job painting that puzzle piece for one, us. One thing occurred to me is that the response to ayahuasca is hugely varied. We don't understand what accounts for such variation. And in two people, 
same size, same body weight, um, drink the same. Uh, one person sit there all night twiddling their thumbs, and the next person has an incredibly amazing experience. And you drink tonight, well, you saw it in the film, you drink one day, and the next day you build an expectation. I think expectation has a lot to do with it, and the next night you're like, the Brazilians have a great word for it, by the way, that the medicine gave them a spanking. So, <laughs> it's, I like that one. But, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of variation, and, and variation in the healing. Some people do get what you could refer to, and we've talked before, but, you know, a, a, a mindset, it, it does happen, but it's not so common, like a one-off kind of thing. And I think there's a lot to learn from the addiction recovery movement of healing as a process of in recovery and it's really all just about working towards improving your overall state of wellness and healing that it maybe never really done and I think that's reflected in your comments and uh, also some people try it and they just have an instinct right away no this is not my medicine it's interesting they said no it's, it just doesn't resonate exactly with me and and they're intelligent healers and people with healing experience. So, so I think there's also that. Some some plants speak to people differently. Can I just make one comment about that? Because pharmaceuticals tend to deprive me of some of my initiatives. Exactly. I tend to deaden my, my Exactly. So exactly. I was wondering, if I was to use Pyroska, would I still have the same desires and drives and, and you know, aims and goals? Oh, you're, you've really hit on an important point. Most of our antidepressant medication anyway just kind of dulls everything. And this does not happen with ayahuasca. It, it actually opens up the senses. Uh, that's my experience anyway, and what I, what I read in my experience. Uh, it's, it opens up, doesn't shut down. The most recent research with Carhartt Harris is starting to center in on these things, that the difference between the antidepressant blunting of the emotional processing how psychedelics can sometimes help us enhance that to try and work through those traumas. Well, that's consistent with one of my favorite authors, Graham Hancock, who's a large advocate for ayahuasca, and yet he's got a mission in life to, uh, you know, enlighten the world uh, to some big secrets, and, and uh, it hasn't taken the edge off of him. So I, I think I agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Um, perfect. I think. Um, did that help a lot with those, those, those questions yeah, there? I was just gonna respond to this gentleman and I, I think that ayahuasca actually humanizes you more. I, I think it, um, when we talk, we think about how we are in society that we're so controlled, our thoughts and our actions and our behaviors and what we believe in because of societal norms and, um, and medications and those things that are part of our life now and getting involved with something like ayahuasca kind of strips all that away and kind of takes you back to who you should be like as your child as your original which is all your you know your thinking your feeling your heart your soul i appreciate what you're saying however i was trying to attend for the show tonight and i had to talk about a bunch of things that are going on in the world that most people are oblivious to and i'm just wondering if i had ayahuasca would I become oblivious to those things? Or would I still be driven to do the research to find out what we talked about earlier? Um, you know, there's, there, there are some big hoaxes out there, there are some big crimes against humanity, and unless you're driven and have the time and aren't distracted by a career and family and pension and all this stuff, you don't have the time to do the research. And yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. However, I'm trying to do it. And there are, are truths that need to be exposed. Um, I don't think it's kind of, it, it, I'm just uh, reacting kind of off the top of my head. It, it could kind of either go two ways for you. It, it could ask you to direct some of that energy elsewhere for your own healing. That maybe that preoccupation is harmful in some way to you. Or it may accelerate it and, and make it even more, like a natural curiosity could accelerated so it's a little hard to predict exactly what would happen with that one but there's another point both from what you were saying and what David alluded to reminds me of a hugely important book that I would recommend you read called The Biology of Belief it 
was a hugely important book, and it was really important for me. So they, when it was a biologist who, Bruce Lipton, who uh, studied cells and cellular life, and spent his whole career looking inside microscopes and cells, and trained in traditional biology that all, all the meaning of everything was in the DNA. All the meaning of everything was inside the cell, in the little threads of DNA, that everything was kind of programmed and planned, and your response to things, et cetera, et cetera. And he had this epiphany that it wasn't what's inside the cell, it's the membrane of the cell. In other words, the membrane controls what goes in and what goes out. Membrane expels what you don't need and allows in what you do need. And if the membrane is screwed up, the bad shit comes in and the good stuff can't get out. It's such a simple analogy. So, so when you when you um, expand on the analogy to how maybe the brain works, or how a person works, or how spirituality works, or how a community should work, or how global society should work. It, it's about creating protective membranes that allow filters, that have filters of good and keep the bad out. It's, it's a terrific analogy, but I think it has a lot to do with how ayahuasca is actually working um, at a cellular level, even allowing more permeability in the connections of the nervous system in particular. And, and I think actually physi physiologically, we haven't touched on healing power of ayahuasca in the jungle for all kinds of things. And, and research, for example, on Parkinson's and other symptoms are very different. And I keep the, if you haven't read that book, I really recommend reading it. Why would you? Why would you have to read it? And you'll see further into the conference, we have speakers that will be talking um, who are directly researching a lot of these topics. David Nichols, Robin Carver Harris. So you'll see a lot more perspectives of and um, really trying to make that puzzle come together. Because um, I think that's a big part of this, is seeing all those different perspectives and how we can shed major light on all of this. Um, so do we have another question over here as well? Uh, I just wanted to get a final thought from you know, each of you. Uh, so we are like a kind of an issue pretty close to genetics, and we are all like, uh, you know, aware of what's going on. But like, what would you tell to people who are afraid of psychedelics? How would you tell someone who's suffering, who's afraid of psychedelics, you know, to, to embrace it or to like try or like, you know, people who are just you know, afraid of psychedelics, what would you tell to them? Does anyone want to go first on that one at all? Or did we get you know that? Um, well, here's, here's, the, yeah, here's the interesting thing. Um, it has to call you, right? It's not something that I believe that you have to push on yourself. It's not something that uh, is for necessarily the weak-hearted, neither. It's, it's, they say it's the way of the warrior, right? Um, so it has to call you, and, and if you have that inkling of interest, if you pay attention to some of the, you know, the articles, if, if you have just that small little sparkle of, hmm, then pursue it. But if not, then it's maybe not the route for you, is what I would say. Um, in my, in my experience, um, I've talked to quite a few people about it, because um, people have asked me questions that are interested in it. And it's almost impossible to go, at least in my, in my perspective, going into a, a ceremony with any psychedelic and not being nervous. There's always this anticipation <laughs> what's going to happen and and that can be accelerated um, but what I've seen in the practice like the centers that I've gone is, is usually they start low and go slow and the very first um, ayahuasca the, uh, ceremony I was ever in was just a very very mild dose and that was just to see uh, to ease into it and to start seeing what is it actually going to be like because it's impossible to tell same thing with psilocybin LSD um, all of those things have been very slow, uh, very low doses, uh, where I felt comfortable then that say, okay, I'm going to increase it, um, or you know what, maybe not my cup of tea, 
So I would say if anybody's um, interested in it, most of the centers that I, I'm aware of uh, do start off, um, they'll have say three ceremonies, four ceremonies, whatever it is, but they don't say here, drink the whole cup. <laughs> they'll be like, okay, they talk to you. And then, I mean, you have just a little bit just to see. And then next time you go and go, okay, I know a little bit more about it. I feel a little more comfortable. It's not gonna harm me. Also being in a, a group setting really helps uh, with people um, because I'm sure there's obviously there's other people that are going to be nervous as well and then coming out on the other side it's like okay that's what it's kind of like and then then when you go a little heavier you just kind of prepare yourself but don't don't push yourself thinking I've got to I've got to slam back a huge cup of this or, or eat you know so many grams of this it's just start at your own pace so you feel comfortable so your mind is at ease going in and I think the experience would be much better rather than uh, it could be traumatic I guess if it's if it's too powerful so was the one thing I was going to speak to as well is the preparation, the arming yourself with education, the arming yourself with a good support network of people who understand what you're going through and what you might be embarking on with these journeys. Look at the Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> right at the beginning of that movie, arms himself Frodo, right? With all the people that have the different tools to help him embark on the journey. Then there's Gandalf with the wisdom that he tried to hold on to, right? And through the journey, that preparation was an entire first movie, wasn't it? <laughs> they didn't really get walking through Mordor till the last movie. <laughs> so that preparation should take the most time. And for me, I'd spent maybe three to four years researching psychedelics before I took my first microdose. Because <laughs> so I wanted to make sure. And I was a working paramedic. I've seen people benefiting from it, but I didn't want to have those same fears. Am I going to lose my ability to be me? But from the research and where I'd found myself at that point in my life, I then felt supported and comfortable, and my parents are here, and I'm glad that they were able to support me. When I first started talking to them about, hey, you know, uh, been a paramedic for a bit, might start smoking some cannabis and uh, trying some psilocybin. <laughs> but here they are today, um, happy and supportive. So it's like taking off that winter coat. Trauma is like putting on a big winter coat, and psychedelics is like allowing you to undo that zipper and seeing it for a bit. So, um, Dr. Rush, I, I think Brian it's Rush. Terrific. I think it's a just on. I think it's a terrific question and maybe a good one to end on if we're there. Um, I like to be careful, go slow, and in a way let it call you. Um, some people are desperate, um, and I, I get an email at least one a week of where can I go, is there studies I can participate in, like the sense of desperation is there, so people can maybe make judgment calls too quickly. Um, Number one, there are contraindications. Uh, if you or the people that you're talking to the medicine for you right away, that's for sure. Um, uh, also, extreme mood swings, mania or, or depression are contraindicated because they can really be too much to handle uh, and um, so there are kind of simple contraindications we kind of know that now um, the other is it was interesting in the movie too that some people just are afraid to purge uh, they and they relate the purging to being sick so they think well why would I take this to get sick and if you're afraid of that then respect that like don't push yourself there's other things that you can try that are not going to be have such a physical um, and it takes time to learn that the purging is actually such a part of a cleansing which they also did well in the film too eh? but you know purging out the hate and it wasn't until he was really able to let it go physically that the actual psychological healing happened and there's this incredible synchronicity between the physical and the mental um, in, in the experience right uh, and, and ayahuasca may not be the best first choice if you've never had any experience with hallucinogens because the first experience that often the chakruna comes in quickly and it's all dazzly and, and you think, Jesus, this is, you know, I'm going crazy. And it's only later get a bit more of a physical and kind of emotional impact. And it's important as you quote unquote learn to work with the medicine, uh, you learn not to get carried away with the dazzling lights. There's actually work to do. <laughs> right? so, um, so if you've not had any experience with, um, with hallucinogens and that experience, you, 
you can either be uh, really afraid of it and get, get distracted or get too distracted and enjoying it too much and forget that there's more work to be done. I remember my first time, and that happened to me, and I had experiences as a teenager. I'm from the 60s, so what do you expect, right? And uh, um, I remember sitting there. You don't have to try everything. <laughs> that was what I said to myself. What the hell are you doing? You don't have to try everything. And then I got through it, and, and I've learned to um, respect it, and uh, you, you learn to work with it. And, I, and I'm one in many who we don't chase it. Like don't, you don't need to chase it. It'll find you when you think you might need it again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Mapping the Mind. Um,